Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Fred Murphy of the Marxist Education Project, and I'd like to welcome everybody to this presentation by Steve Mayer on his new book, Corporate Capitalism and the Integral State, uh, in which uh, Steve is going to explain to us how corporate power is a feature, not a bug, of our current political system. Uh, Steve's the associate editor of the Socialist Register, and as such, is a good friend of the Marxist Education Project. We've worked with him on presenting several series of events involving uh, contributors to the register. He's a postdoctoral fellow at Ontario Tech University in Canada and a member of the Toronto-based Socialist Project, which supports the rebuilding of the socialist left in Canada and around the world, as do we. Uh, just before uh, we begin, I just want to call people's attention to one upcoming event uh, next week that uh, the Marxist Education Project will sponsor with the editors of a new book called Utopia and Modernity in China, Contradictions in Transition. Uh, and I will put a link to that in the chat. Uh, please join us for that uh, in next Saturday, uh, June 4th. Uh, so without further ado, I'll turn it over to Steve. Thanks, Fred. Um, so, you know, the book is, um, like Fred mentioned, called Corporate Capitalism and Integral State. First of all, I want to say uh, thanks to the Marcus Education Project for having me here um, and setting up this event. It's always nice to see you guys, and it's, it's good to be kind of uh, back in, on a Zoom call with, with you guys. Um, so first, I'm going to just kind of lay out some of the broad uh, theoretical positions and debates that the book is trying to intervene in, and then I'll also get to presenting some of the history, I think, through, through that um, in the course of, of laying that out. So what I basically wanted to do with the book was to kind of puzzle out the relationship between the state and the corporation, uh, and therefore class formation, because the, the practical way in which the capitalist class exists, the way its our power is articulated and organized at a given point in time is through the corporation. So the corporation is the kind of embodiment of the economic power of capital and the relationships between different kinds of capitalists that are articulated through the corporation, you know, between investors and managers um, is, is determines and reflects the structure of capitalist class power at a particular time. So the study of the corporation is to a very significant extent, the study of capitalist class formation what you're actually looking at when you're looking at the corporation is the practical way that capitalist class power exists and is reproduced at a given point in time. And that has enormously important uh, implications for how we think of political strategy and also how we think of uh, our current uh, the, the level of democracy in our current political system. Um, the second thing, so that was the kind of broad question that I wanted to ask. But more specifically, there's been this kind of upsurge of literature from within the kind of mainstream social democratic left um, that basically argues that tries to explain the tremendous rise in inequality since the 1970s, you know, what we call the neoliberal period, based on an, a sudden kind of explosion of corporate lobbying that happened since the 1980s. But what's, what's interesting about this literature is that, number one, it doesn't actually try to explain at all, even attempt to explain the uh, reason why corporate lobbying would suddenly have, corporations would suddenly have the capacity to increase, to overcome the collective action problem and increase their lobbying, their lobbying force at that given point in time. And secondly, it doesn't actually examine historically at all, despite its claims, the, the real concrete institutional relationship between these lobbying organizations and the state executive. So uh, what actually, Turn, what actually turns out to be the case when you look through the archives, as, we're gonna, as I'm going to mention in a minute, is that the state is not merely the kind of passive recipient of pressures from these lobbying groups at all, but actually state agencies and state officials play a very active part in, in mobilizing and even informing corporate lobby groups, which don't just express pre-existing pre business concerns and interests, but actually are venues within which those interests are formed. So... The, the, the lobbying literature, then, the mainstream kind of social democratic lobbying literature serves to kind of narrow the focus of our political critique by suggesting that we can kind of restore a normal pluralist democracy by limiting the impact of corporate power on the state, by constraining its ability to lobby, by limiting its ability to access you know, specific pathways to access specific officials, we can actually create a more pluralist 
democratic state, such as would normally be the case apparently before the 1970s. Of course, those of us who are Marxists would never argue that that was the case before the 1970s, but the mainstream literature kind of does imply that. Uh, but more puzzlingly, this framing leaves the state no room whatsoever to make policy. Apparently, the state, state officials state in the executive branch do nothing other than pick up the phone and take calls from capitalists all day and then implement the policies that those capitalists want. But in fact, that's, that's ludicrous. I mean, the state is the largest employer in the United States by far. It has, you know, armies, uh, quite literally, but also figuratively, of officials who do nothing other than spend their days uh, figuring out what kinds of policies are needed to address various issues related to global capitalism and geopolitical conflict. So they hardly need corporations to, to, to tell them what to do. And in fact, corporations are concerned with other issues. Uh, so the Marxist state theory, which offers an alternative to this kind of neo-pluralist framing, you know, says that the state is relatively autonomous from capital and it differentiates between the interests of individual capitals versus the long-term systemic interests of the system as a whole. So Marxist state theory begins from the premise that corporations, individual corporations are primarily concerned with competing with each other. They are interested in maximizing their own bottom lines and in capturing the largest amount of surplus value that they can. Whereas the systemic stability of the system as a whole, the long-term general interest of capital requires a relatively autonomous state that is at some remove from the immediate interests of particular capitalists to then articulate the long-term general interests of the system as a whole, and therefore to organize the capitalist class by doing so as a class. Um, and you know, Palancis has the famous quote, the state organizes capital and disorganizes the working class. But the problem is that even Marxist state theory, despite having those promising starting points, never really concretized how the state organizes capital. The process institutionally and historically whereby the state actually achieves a consensus among business around the policies and initiatives that it wants to implement. So very often, and, I and indeed Poulantzis himself, you know, sees this in terms of the state creating an unstable equilibrium of compromise between the objective interests, which are in conflict, of different fractions of capital, as he calls it. Not just firms, but fractions, you know, groups of firms, groups of capitals. And these fractions are assumed to have objective interests that are essentially self-evident and fixed. And then the role of the state as a capitalist state is to balance these objective interests and to create an unstable equilibrium of compromise between them. Now, of course, there's a lot of truth to this. Capitalists are competing, firms are fractious, the capitalist class has no inherent intrinsic unity politically apart from the activity of the state. That is all correct. But the problem is that it fails to account for the ways in which the interests of these individual capitalists are themselves changed and developed through the process of an engagement with the state to reach a consensus as a political unity as a class. So the state itself, you know, the state does indeed, you know, organize capitalists as a class because they can't do that without the state. But in the process of that happening, a coalition is built, capitalist interests themselves are developed and changed as those uh, managers or whoever is representing particular fractions of capital are educated and their perspective shifts around different issues. Uh, but perhaps more directly to the point of the book, uh, the classical Marxist state theory, not classical, sorry, the, the neo-Marxist state theory that emerged in the 1960s and 70s, uh, it didn't really have a robust theorization of civil society. So you, you know, there, there is really a, a, a very limited uh, theorization of the role that civil society organizations play in articulating the, cap the hegemony of the capitalist class as a whole. This literature was profoundly concerned is profoundly concerned with delimiting the institutions of the capitalist state in explaining their function in relation to accumulation, the structural needs of accumulation, and in illustrating the relationship between capitalist app state apparatuses and the ruling class. But missing from this theorization, or at least downplayed too much in it or underdeveloped within it, is an understanding of, of 
how organizations that are not part of the formal apparatus of the capitalist state still serve to articulate the general interests of capital within what Gramsci called a hegemonic apparatus. So a hegemonic kind of structure of class power, a broad class-wide political power of the capitalist class. So I basically argue in the book that Gramsci's theory of the integral state allows us, you know, developing that theory allows us a pathway to kind of get through some of these problems and mount a renewed critique against the neo-pluralist framing, which he's the state, as I mentioned, as a kind of passive recipient of, pre of pressures from business lobbying. Gramsci's theory of the integral state basically was defined as civil society plus political society. It, 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 was, a, it was a definition of the state. Uh, Gramsci, you know, advances several different somewhat contradictory definitions of the state. But when he's talking about the integral state, he, he refers to this as civil society plus political society. And he describes how it incorporates all those organizations which serve to articulate a hegemonic apparatus, which serve to articulate the political structure of a society to a hegemonic apparatus of class power, of capitalist class power. And so I basically argue that this incorporates, for the reasons that I will mention in a minute, major business lobbies. And the reason why is because these, as I was just mentioning, these, these lobbies do not just serve as means for business to articulate its pre-existing interests, but are actually forums within which state agencies themselves serve to organize the interests of capital, serve to create a consensus among capital around the general interests of the capitalist class. And to sort this out historically, I turn to the case of General Electric. Uh, which was one of the first capitalist corporations and which also grew up to become one of the most prominent multinational corporations up until its, its recent kind of uh, crisis period beginning in, uh, after the 2008 crisis. Um, from basically the 1930s, so the book starts in the 1880s and shows how GE formed out of the uh, 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 interaction between state regulation and the uh, organizational um, and competitive drive of the finance capitalists like J.P. Morgan. Um, but it, it wasn't until the 1930s, the Great Depression, when, when the investment banks you know, experienced such a massive uh, crisis that GE really emerged as, as the center or a crucial center within the capitalist class uh, politically, and in particular, a pillar of this integral state. So I developed a theory uh, from Gramsci's, uh, the bones that Gramsci laid out, I developed the theory of the integral state based on undertaking, you know, extensive archival research into the um, executive branch agencies of the American government. Um, and, you know, thousands of pages of research, tons of, of, of documents and all that stuff. But what I found was that um, state officials were very aware of the role of business associations in mobilizing business. They were very aware throughout this whole period of how business associations are, are, are actually ways within which capital is being organized on behalf of particular agendas, not just expressing those agendas to the state, but actually building consensus within themselves around particular political orientations among business. And state officials very deliberately and actively sought to play a role in contributing to what that consensus looked like. And in this process, uh, business, certain business associations stood out as venues within which the general interests of the capitalist class as a whole were, were articulated and formed. And so it, did, it was the case that, you know, obviously business lobbying continued to occur you know, particular sectors or firms continue to try to minimize the costs that they would have to face of whatever particular policy the state was considering or had passed. Um, but at the same time, other business associations were distinguished by adopting a cooperative relationship with state agencies and in articulating the class-wide general interest of capital as a whole. That's why I argue that, you know, to be honest, looking at what's going on within business associations can be just as interesting, if not more so, as what's going on between business associations and the state. 
because it's by looking inside of those business associations and lobby groups that you can see these processes of organizing the interests of the capitalist class playing out. Um, on the other side of this equation, so capital is articulated as a class-wide political force, as a class political force, not just particular businesses, but as a class through this process of consensus building. On the other hand, in order for the state to function and make sound policy in the context of a capitalist society, it has to continuously and systematically coordinate with corporations. Like in order for it to just do its basic job, state agencies need constant systematic collaboration and input with, from business. Their basic organizational integrity relies on being able to bring business interests into their policymaking processes and into the processes whereby they formulate their own uh, objectives and, and, and policy perspectives. Um, sometimes this consensus building and integration of corporate power with the state uh, occurs through private organizations, as was the case with the business roundtable. And sometimes it occurs through public organizations as was the case with the Business Advisory Council, which Roosevelt formed by executive order uh, explicitly in order to build consensus around the New Deal programs. And it's, it's remarkable to note that the modern state and corporate bureaucracies emerged at the exact same time at the end of the 19th century, basically. Um, as the increasing complexity of corporate capitalism led to the formation of the Department of Commerce in 1903, which was specifically and explicitly aimed at liaising between the state complex that was increasingly complex itself and corporate institutions, that agency, the Department of Commerce, quickly realized almost immediately after its formation that it could only do its job if it formed a national chamber of commerce, which it proceeded to do immediately, and which it found business was actually quite reluctant to participate in. From business's perspective, they already paid their taxes. Policymaking was Washington's job. They should be able to just go about their business as corporate executives. And they didn't need to participate in these additional meetings, going to Washington, participating in developing a national chamber of commerce. It was after only a decade of wrangling business that the Department of Commerce succeeded in creating a national chamber of commerce, which became the key political venue uh, within which business discussed uh, political issues, came to a consensus, and integrated those consensus with um, political officials in the state. Um, over time, the ability for particular state agencies to mobilize business around their objectives, that is the objectives of particular state agencies. So the state complex is not a, a, a static monolith. The state complex is made is itself made up of different agencies, each of which are vying for influence in the policymaking process and seeking a, lar a larger and more prominent role in developing policy. One way that state agencies can gain a more prominent role in policymaking is by being able to mobilize business interests, bus you know, corporate alliances, in support of their role. This particular dynamic is, is amplified by the fact that state agencies are constitutionally prevented from lobbying Congress. So if a particular business agency wants a larger budget from Congress, or it wants a particular set of legal parameters uh, assigned to its policymaking functions that requires congressional legislation, they rely on business to lobby in behalf of that an agenda in order for that to occur. So the Department of Commerce, for example, which I just mentioned, one of the purposes behind developing the National Chamber of Commerce was to help them develop a, you know, acquire a larger budget that would help them compete with the, with the larger and more established State Department. Building up corporate alliances helped the Department of Commerce get a larger budget, helped it get a more prominent role in policymaking and make it more visible within the state complex, more prominent within the state complex. Um, so the book traces GE's role as a pillar of the integral state in, in, in the unfolding of all these dynamics throughout the history of American capitalism from 1880 to 1980. And GE's centrality within the integral state resulted in part from its centrality within the capitalist class, 
as was reflected in its diversification, uh, which required it to, to maintain extensive supplier and customer networks. Its board of directors was a veritable who's who of the managerial elite. It involved a large number of so-called outside directors long before that became fashionable uh, during the neoliberal period. And so it, it, it was particularly institutionally important in terms of its location within the capitalist class as a base for building a capitalist class consensus. And it worked with state officials to build consensus on everything from the New Deal to the post-war empire, to the turn to neoliberal free trade, including collaborating and organizing, uh, collaborating on organizing and mobilizing lobbying associations. So this was the case when Philip Reed, GE's uh, uh, president, worked on, on the Business Advisory Council, which Franklin Roosevelt uh, created by executive order inside the Department of Commerce explicitly in order to build support among capital for the New Deal programs that were seen as essential to restore accumulation and, and demobilize the working class in the 1930s. Roosevelt himself said, and this is a direct quote from Roosevelt, that the Business Advisory Council was, quote, useless from the point of view of, of facts and policies and only good for the dissemination of morale. So this was an advisory council but which was explicitly aimed at building support among capitalists for the policies that it was supposedly advising the state on. This became a, the, the default mode for these kinds of advisory councils throughout the rest of the history of the period that I looked at. They, they were, they were uh, capitalists could flatter themselves that they were advising the state on important issues of policy. And indeed they were offering important inputs, as I mentioned, for the state to do its job in crafting policy as a relatively autonomous state. But it was also very consciously and explicitly understood by state officials that these advisory councils were also serving a function of, of legitimating the process of state policymaking, of legitimating the role of the state in articulating, developing and implementing policy. Uh, a similar process was at work when GE President Charles Wilson became the most important figure on the War Production Board, as well as simultaneously the private organization, the Committee for Economic Development, which became the most important corporate lobby group of the period, the post-war era. So he's established as the most important figure of the War Production Board, which plans World War II mobilization, industrial mobilization, the economic planning system whereby corporations were basically taken over by the military and made to produce the weaponry necessary to fight World War II. And at the same time as he's made the head of War Production Board, he's also instrumental, one of the key figures in forming the Committee for Economic Development. So his centrality to the capitalist class is reflected in both the public and the private sides of this equation. And the Committee for Economic Development, its initial function was to bring corporations, you know, corporate managers, into the state industrial planning system for World War II, and then to consolidate the permanent military industrial complex after the war. So by no means, it's important to emphasize, was this automatic? The, the support of capital for the levels of taxation that were required for the, the uh, military industrial complex to continue to function after the war in the way that it had during World War II was certainly very contested. And the, um, the, the prior to World War II, the levels of taxation that were implemented during World War II were unheard of. Uh, this was a huge break with history. And for this to continue in peacetime was it was required a major effort to build support on the part of corporate capital and, and, and their state allies. This was even more so true, much more so actually, in the case of free trade after the war. I mean, American corporations had, had flourished since the late, since the 19th century behind what were the highest tariff barriers in the entire world. Suddenly after the war, the State Department is pushing for massive across the board slashing of tariffs unilaterally. That is to say, without even expecting explicit reci reci uh, reciprocation from the American allies uh, and other capitalist powers in the world uh, to reduce their own tariff barriers. 
this was an incredibly thorny issue on the Committee for Economic Development and it, within the capitalist class more broadly, as was the efforts by the, by the state, uh, the American state, immediately after the war, to rebuild the major industrial rivals of the American capitalist class in the, through the Marshall Plan aid to Europe. This was not only incredibly expensive, but capitalists were highly dubious about the value of building up their major competitors uh, at a time when they were uh, in, a, in a kind of unipolar moment at the, at the pinnacle of world order. Of course, the broader dynamics of capitalism require that there be markets for U.S. exports, and that requires the rebuilding of the capitalist states of Europe, and that required, you know, and so on. But from the point of view of capitalists, taking on these expensive Marshall State Marshall Plan programs especially when key European allies that they were going to, not least of which included the Labour government in the UK, appeared to be, from the point of view of these capitalists, socialistic in their inclinations toward extensive welfare state programs and even state ownership of the commanding heights of the economy. The, the merits of supporting these states through Marshall Plan aid was far from obvious and required extensive wrangling on the part of state officials within these institutions in order to convince business to go along with it. Um, so in that moment, after World War II, the State Department took the lead in building support among capital for the Marshall Plan. It worked in the Committee for Economic Development, as well as formed an offshoot of the Committee for Economic Development called the Committee for the Marshall Plan. Uh, meanwhile, the Treasury Department uh, worked on establishing capitalist support for, for the Bretton Woods free trade regime. As a result of these efforts, and I recount them at length in the book, uh, the CED, the Committee for Economic Development, emerged as the most important, and in the view of President Harry Truman, decisive uh, supporter of both Bretton Woods and um, the Marshall Plan, both of which ended up passing Congress with you know, very large margins of support. But again, that was contested. It was far from obvious that that would be the case. Uh, you know, the whole, the, the Council on Foreign Relations is another kind of interesting example of this, because, you know, during World War II, the American state, uh, fairly early on in the war, got underway with planning what the post-war world order would look like. And the Council on Foreign Relations is, you know, very often portrayed as one of the key institutions whereby corporations kind of colonize the state and force it to do what the corporate with, you know, force it to do the bidding of corporations. But if you actually look historically at the way that this worked, the process of post-war planning, the, the key uh, um, uh, agendas, the overall structure of world order, the basic interests that would be uh, animating the American national interest uh, after the end of the world of World War II, all of those were articulated by institutions that were very autonomous from business, that had very limited business representation. The Council on Foreign Relations served much more as a, a, a body that was building business, um, first of all, educating corporate elites around what the national interest of the American state was, what its geopolitical involvement in fact was, but also uh, where corporate, corporate executives could kind of ask questions <laughs> about, about the nature of US foreign policy and provide technical input uh, while building a general kind of broad agreement among the state officials who were leading policy formation in this period and, and the business interests that had to be involved. Uh, like the State Department, in order to craft the post-war order, needed an unprecedented range of information about the patterns of world trade and finance and the whole global economy, of which the state institutions at that point had only a, a, a tiny fraction of the capacity that they now have. Uh, and, and certainly far less than what was needed in order to solve these problems. So the Council on Foreign Relations served more as, a, as an advisory and support role, whereas the actual policy objectives were articulated within much more autonomous um, institutions. Um, later, you know, during the stagflation crisis, you see this again, when um, uh, Se Treasury Secretary John Connolly and Fed Chair Arthur Burns in the middle of the stagflation crisis, um, TAP, GE's CEO, Fred Bork, and Alcoa's CEO, John Harper, to establish a forum comprised of the CEOs of the nation's top executives, which they believed would make it easier 
for these state officials to collaborate with business on resolving the crisis and most importantly, facilitate the implementation of wage and price controls. Because in order to, you know, the first response of the American state, right, during the 1970s crisis was to, was to devise wage and price controls. So literally have a, a regime that determines how much corporations are allowed to raise prices by and how much wages can go up by in order to try to control inflation. Now, of course, this was all about wage restraint and all that. We don't even need to say that. But nevertheless, participating, like implementing this program requires that corporations be represented in these institutions and collaborate systematically with the state on establishing price targets and on enforcing those price targets. So that required systematic involvement, which was kind of ongoing before this moment where the business roundtable is formed. But the business roundtable is formed out of the organizations that were developed around implementing wage and price controls, the pay board and the price commission. And it was formed in part in order to solidify business support for the wage and price control regime. So business, of course, is highly skeptical of wage and price controls. Uh, it's, it's, it's uh, thanks for the 10 minute warning, Fred. Um, you know, they, they want liberal markets. They, want, they don't want the state coming in and telling them how much they can charge for products, even if they understand that this is primarily about wage restraint. But they also recognized you know, while the National Association of Manufacturers and some other organizations, business organizations are kind of like hysterically shouting uh, at, the, at state officials from outside, the CEOs on the business roundtable, which had been formed at the urging of Bork, uh, at the urging of Treasury Secretary John Connolly and Fed Chairman Arthur Burns, uh, distinguished themselves by working in a collaborative way with state officials to recognize, on the, based on the recognition that even though they didn't like price controls. Neither the state officials nor the business executives liked price controls. At the very least, uh, they had to accept that there was no clear alternative to price controls at that, at that point in time. And both sides sought to avoid the pain and uncertainty of the recession that would ultimately come in the form of the Volcker shock, um, which would discipline labor by engineering a recession by raising interest rates. So they were trying to find a way forward amidst tremendous uncertainty. And they were trying to, in the meantime, maintain a base of support for wage and price controls. Neither state officials nor business uh, executives had any clear idea what would be needed, what kind of restructuring, how deep, how extensive, how long lasting would be needed in order to resolve the crisis, discipline labor and end inflation. Um, but what's important in this context is that the business roundtable did not lobby the government for fixed interests in this, in this moment. The business roundtable served as a venue for developing a strategy for getting out of the crisis so that controls can, get, can come to an end. And even after other business associations had long turned against controls, the business roundtable continued to support them as the lesser of a variety of possible evils. So neoliberalism didn't emerge from the brain from corporate lobbying, lobbying for objective interests, and it didn't emerge from the brains of state officials uh, as they tried to impose the doctrines of Milton Friedman or, or Friedrich von Hayek. Neoliberalism emerged from the process of class struggle as the state sought in collaboration with business to find a way out of the crisis based on muddling through without knowing what was going to work and what wasn't without knowing how permanent these changes would have to be, while believing for nearly a decade, at least somewhat in the state, that wage and price controls could kind of temporarily hold things together while until you know, the post-war boom was able to, to resume. Um, so the same dynamic kind of played itself out with the, the collapse of Bretton Woods and the turn to neoliberal free trade, where Carter established the President's Export Council as a venue for uh, solidifying business support for the new free trade agreement that would, uh, for, for the uh, global trade order that would replace the Bretton Woods system. Um, before I run out of time, I just wanna note that the book also tells the story um, of the development and restructuring of corporate capitalism in the US through the lens of GE. So it, it tells the story of the integral state. It tells the story of how, um, you know, business and the state work together. The state mobilizes business around particular policy initiatives and so on. It also tells the story, though, of how the corporation is restructured over time and how the corporation comes to look different 
in different periods of capitalist development. And in so doing, it takes on the many theories which have seen finance as a kind of parasite on the real economy that, you know, hollows out production or imposes a short-termist view on business. And it shows instead how finance was always central to corporate organization from its very earliest origins, when corporations were formed by investment bankers like J.P. Morgan, as GE was, all the way through the period of, of, of you know, the post-war period, when finance became more important within the corporation as a result of its diversification and internationalization, you know, corporate executives came to rely more on, 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 on internal markets, what really you could describe as internal markets, where business divisions are kind of competing for investment from top executives, rather than a kind of Weberian planning system. Uh, because of the complexity of managing these firms, you know, individual business divisions had to kind of be reorganized as, as individual businesses. And top executives basically became kind of investors. So corporations, industrial corporations were kind of restructured as investment groups. This did not hollow out production, but it intensified the flexibility that managers had to restructure. It intensified, it increased and enhanced the mobility of capital and therefore the competitiveness of these corporate institutions and an increased discipline on the business units that make up these multinational corporations to maximize the exploitation of labor, to maximize profits, um, and to compete. It also means that it's impossible to separate, you know, politically, as is so often done, bad finance from good manufacturing as we try to figure out a way to devise reforms. The problems of finance, this means, are the problems of capitalism itself. And as I show in the book, you know, finance and industry became only more entangled over time. And by the time you get up to the neoliberal period with globalization, their interests are very closely interlinked to the extent that they're almost indistinguishable. So I can leave it there. Um, I, I'm sure I'm about out of time. We can now turn to the discussion. I tried to get through a lot of stuff pretty quickly. I hope it was comprehensible for people. Um, but we can, we can, I can, you know, take any questions if people have some, or we can flesh out any part of the book that might be unclear. Steve, thank you very much. Uh, this is extremely interesting stuff, and I hope uh, there will be a, a good discussion. Uh, if you wish to speak, you can use the Zoom feature to raise your hand, or you can just type the word "stack" into the chat panel, uh, and we'll add you to the speaker's stack. Uh, I might uh, get us started with a question. Uh, I'm curious about, and perhaps your research really didn't touch on this, but it seems like there's probably some uh, parallel kind of uh, state uh, organization or, or disorganization in Palancis' terms of, uh, of labor and the trade union bureaucracy and the way in which the state, state agencies like the Department of Labor and and uh, the National Labor Relations Board and so on uh, engage in somewhat similar kinds of, uh, of activities. Am I, am I on the right track there uh, in terms of the way in which the capital, capital state seeks to uh, hegemonize, integrate, and uh, subordinate uh, labor through, through these kinds of efforts? Yeah, I think, I think you are. And this is, you know, this gets back to Leo Panitz's work on corporatism, which was very influential for me to formulate the, the idea that I, uh, you know, that I just presented of how the state integrates and organizes you know, business associations. Um, you know, it's, it's not exactly correct, I don't think, to say that the state, you know, as Pulancis did, that the state disorganizes labor. In fact, in many respects, the state organizes labor. Labor unions are, you know, established through law and um, corporatism certainly in the 1970s was based on integrating workers with the structures of kind of managerial capitalism uh, through top-down bureaucratic labor unions, which which certainly were able to win wage gains for workers, but also serve to discipline labor uh, and 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 give capital labor peace and to regularize and systematize kind of class conflict. Um, so yeah, the the state organizes labor in a particular way. Um, it organizes labor in a subordinate position to capital and it, it, it above all seeks uh, labor discipline. But yeah, Fred, I think you're absolutely on, on the right track there in, this, in the sense that uh, Leo's, Leo Panich's work on corporatism you know, shows how um, by, by becoming integrated with the state through, through the 1970s wage and price controls and incomes policies, you know, trade unions um, were reinforced in certain ways, but also co-opted and, and, and their, their, the range of their political scope, you know, very much constrained. 
Okay, so we've got, let's take a Michael and Tanner and then uh, Steve can respond and then we'll take some more questions. Thank you, Fred. Um, thank you for the presentation. I don't know that I, um, I, I guess I have a question about um, continuity in terms of the states, the state over time um, or, or discontinuity as you have researched it what accounts for, um, you know, as different administrations come in, there's a lot of turnover in Washington, um, Democrat, Republican, there is some continuity there, I would imagine, in terms of how um, capital is advised, consensus is achieved. Um, what is your sense of like how this consents how the state how state actors or, or repre representatives of the state get to their vision of how things should be organized i mean are they reading a kind of uh um funhouse mirror version of capital volume one through three <laughs> and and you know in, in business schools or something um did, did you have any sense of that and finally um you, you what you're saying <clears throat> makes me think of what people we're sort of pulling their hair out after the, you know, during and after the um, financial crisis that, you know, all that money that went to TARP and all these, you know, and to bail out the banks, they should have gone to homeowners and they should have been able to help people. And that's not what the state is concerned with. I mean, that's my, you know, reading of people like Andrew Kleinman, who wrote about the uh, economic crisis, like the, it, the state is concerned with maintaining capitalism uh, as bush said this sucker could go down it's not about charity and it's not about doing quote unquote the right thing for you know um the working class as no i don't think anybody on this call needs to be reminded uh thanks for your time steve thanks for your work thanks michael um fred should i answer that now or wait for Tanner? uh yeah that was a pretty substantive uh intervention so we'll we'll go with that and then we'll come back to tanner once you're uh, responded to michael yeah, that's a really well posed question, Michael. Um, so my perspective, to be honest, is, is that basically the state officials are muddling through. They're, 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 they're dealing with a situation that, you know, in any potential conjunction that they're in that vastly exceeds their ability to know what's going on. And they're, they're coming up with it with whatever analysis that they can based on the data that they have of potential issues. Uh, in terms of crises, and and they're trying to resolve them or alleviate them um, based on the the policy tools that they have at their disposal and the institutional means that they've developed. Um, so they are trying to come up with an analysis of the of the system wide issues that capitalism is facing, the contradictions that it's facing, and they try to in, to intervene with policy in order to address those contradictions. Part of how they have to do that is by soliciting input from business in order to know what the hell is going on. So they have to they have to bring businessmen into these advisory commissions in order to ask them what the business outlook is that they're facing, how the things are going for their sector, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they come up with an analysis. And they also have obviously all the economic data that they gather constantly and systematically. And they're always trying to kind of uh, alleviate contradictions and, and, and confront challenges geopolitically and economically and so on. But it's not even just a matter of crisis because the state itself is constantly a force that's organizing business, right? So, so even when there's not a crisis, um, even the most mundane policy initiatives require collaboration, consultation, intervention, uh, 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 and the development of institutions for doing that between, between state officials and corporate executives. Moreover, like the state, especially the American state, right, is constantly giving like a large amount of subsidies through its industrial policy system, which is basically the military industrial complex, which plays a huge role in, 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 in anchoring or reproducing the competitiveness of its leading multinational corporations. So all of those things have to be administered through very close consultation between corporate executives and state officials. Um, so they have their view of how capitalism works, which, which you know, it, they've gotten their education from wherever they get it from. They're not all uh, business school people, right? A lot of state officials are lawyers or political science people or uh, you know, any number of different possible backgrounds. Uh, many of them worked in business as well or, or finance. 
And they, based on their understanding of how the system works, which you know comes from reading Keynes, which is a domestication of Marx in many respects, comes from reading Friedman, comes from just analyzing the situation. They are trying to make policy by fumbling in the dark and seeing what works. Uh, that's my impression. They muddle through, basically. Um, I forget the other part of your question. I hope that answers what you were asking. Okay, uh, Tanner, you want to go ahead? Oh, thanks so much. Congratulations, Steve. Uh, brilliant work. Um, you kind of just answered my question when responding to uh, the previous, but I'll, I'll throw it back at you in a slightly uh, different form. Um, so you shift away from a variant of instrumentalism, like fractions of capital lobbying the state to get it to do what it wants them to do and then get what they want from the state to this really innovative variant of relative autonomy, like state actors taking the lead, trying to unify fractions of disparate competitive capital into a coherent class. You know, it just makes me wonder sort of like what motivates at that institutional level state personnel decision makers and technocrats to behave the way they do you sort of frame that as a muddle right and i really appreciate the contingency and institutional variances that like a muddle might provide as an explanatory framework but i want you to sort of push that a little bit further so beyond just a muddle is it like a sense of there are discourses within each state apparatus that are rationalizing certain kinds of uh, individual state actors to conduct themselves in the way they do is it sort of like the, the integral state concept or is there's always these fractions and alliances between state and then sort of non-state capital actors that are feeding in the kind of an information machine that's kind of always already informing sort of and guiding the conduct of state personnel? Or is it like ideology? Because you kind of dismiss the ideology piece as well. And I really appreciate that. But at the same time, I wonder, does ideology have a role to play here, too? So it's just sort of the bigger question is that at that sort of meso level, not a macro level or micro level, why do state actors behave the way they do in wanting to unify the capitalist class in these moments of crises and contradiction? Um, and what really drives them to behave that way? Even so, if we were going to even do an ethnography of institutions, right, and start interviewing, as you have in many respects, like, what would you get? Like, when they're saying, is it just, just a muddle? I didn't know what I was doing, but it was a problem, and there were some solutions, and we kind of, is it, is it that kind of contingent, or is it something else? So... Anyway, yeah, it's a, it's a really, question. really, really good question, Tanner. Um, so basically, state agencies have, you know, their, their primary interest is in, so the state complex as a whole, first of all, start from that, it's, it's, its primary function and orientation is to make the system work. Every state agency ultimately depends for its legitimacy and for its basic functioning on making the system work. If the system breaks, obviously policy has failed. Every state official accepts that. So you don't want to make policy that's going to break the system or cause a crisis of any kind. You want to make policy in a way that facilitates the functioning of the system. So that then, therefore, requires that you gather information about what the system needs, how it works, uh, what the problems with it might be, and so on and such forth, what the imperatives of competitiveness are driving it towards, and you try to make policy on that basis. Now, within that, state agencies have their own particular institutional interests. This is true both in terms of the scope of their area of work, the, the, their, their particular area of policy that they are concerned with, but there's a lot of overlap there. And moreover, different policy tools could oftentimes be, be mobilized in support of the same problem. So it's a question of which agency is going to get to use its tools as well. And in that situation, the primary interest, to, interest of the state agency is in uh, reproducing itself and its position or improving its position within the state complex. And one way in which they do that is by mobilizing corporate alliances. And you see this happen again and again uh, throughout the history of, that I recount in the book. So one good example is, is the free trade, uh, the turn from capital controls to free trade in the 1970s with the end of Bretton Woods. Um, the Department of Commerce, there was a big question over which state agency was going to be responsible for as the new kind of a primary world trade agency, international trade association, they wanted to call it. So there was different ideas. Should we create a new agency that would be responsible for administering the, the new trade regime in, domestically in terms of securing American compliance and, and then monitoring our competitors, American competitors for compliance? Or should we locate this new agency inside of the State Department? Should we locate it inside of the Commerce Department? Uh, or should we, should we um, divide its functions across multiple different departments? The ultimate conclusion 
and, and the Commerce Department, and all it, this immediately sets off a, a storm of, of competition and memos, arguments from a range of state agencies arguing that they want to be the ones that are going to house this new, very important trade agency. Um, the ultimate conclusion. So from the very beginning of, of the American state in the 19th century, the Department of Commerce was set up as an agency that was the least like possible autonomous thing from capital that you can imagine. It was literally like kind of the voice of corporations in the state, as much as you could imagine that, that playing out. But Department of Commerce in this context, even though it acknowledges like in internal memos that that's the case and that that's its function, they then say we have to present this to the administration as if this isn't the case, because otherwise they'll never let us be the ones that get at that that gets these new trade functions. So we have to present it to the administration as if we're, we've we've reformed ourselves. We're now very autonomous from business. We're not going to be beholden to particularistic interests. We're going instead to kind of look out for the broad interests of the system as a whole, which was the condition, which was understood to be among state officials, the condition whereby the the administration would assign responsibility for these functions. In other words, what the administration is looking for is for an agency that's not going to be beholden or captured by the particular interests of capital, but able to act autonomously. So these agencies are making this case that we can be autonomous. What ends up happening, there was a whole mess in the 1960s with free trade where capital ended up, have, there ended up emerging a crisis between the state and capital because capital felt that the state was, you know, big business felt that the state was not listening to its interests in, 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 in pushing forward a huge round of tariff reductions. And that the, the process of free trade after Kennedy was kind of discredited among capital or large parts of it until the 1970s. So turning to a new round of free trade thereby was a challenge as well from the point of view of legitimation of capital. So what they ended up doing was basically creating an unprecedented, massively extensive advisory system in the Department of Commerce to advise the trade negotiators as they were going to Tokyo to negotiate the new trade agreement for what replaced Bretton Woods. Like this thing had like 33 different technical advisory committees, each of which was subdivided into different subcommittees. Each one of these subcommittees met regularly and had full-time commerce personnel going to every single meeting. You know, every single American firm from across the entire economy was represented on this thing. Like, you know, it's, it was massive, not every firm, sorry, a representative sample of firms from every sector of the American economy was on this thing, like hundreds and hundreds of people who needed security clearance to participate. I mean, it was a massive, massive undertaking, which very quickly consumed almost all of the resources of the Commerce Department. So that was understood to serve a function of legitimating free trade after the disaster of the Kennedy years with capital. That was ex very explicitly articulated as a function that it was serving. But the actual levers of trade policy ended up being concentrated in the U.S. Trade Representative Office, which was created at that time, and was kept at an arm's length from the direct input of corporations on the advisory system. So the Commerce Department is fighting for itself to have this function. The State Department is fighting for itself to have greater trade functions. And the administration is the one that ultimately makes the decision to give commerce something to give the State Department something in terms of this uh, program of supporting business with setting up uh, subcontracts and so on in, in other, in other uh, countries where they're foreign investing. And, and then to create the US Trade Representative Office, which would be autonomous enough to actually formulate interests, you know, you know, policy and in the class-wide interests of capital as a whole. Uh, and then to uh, uh, develop the mechanisms to, to enforce that, which capital didn't like. Because part of this whole process also was, was increasingly whittling down the ability for business to, to secure even temporary adjustment assistance for uh, pains caused by or losses caused by liberalization, free trade. So previously, you could kind of apply and you could get temporary adjustment assistance to make up for those losses, which was a crucial part of building the consensus among capital for free trade after the war. But those kinds of programs with each successive agreement got whittled away to basically nothing. So Agencies, to answer your question, are competing with each other inside of the state to take on broader policy scope, to play a larger role in whatever policies are being format, formulated, and to get a larger budget and to, and to produce, reproduce their position within the state hierarchy. Uh, in order to do so, they're trying to, they're trying to establish alliances with business, uh, which supports their position within the state complex, 
But ultimately, the state is relatively autonomous. So it's not completely autonomous, as in theta scotch pole. It's relatively autonomous. And it can act in ways, uh, it's, it's organizationally and institutionally designed to act in ways that protect its autonomy and pre- prevent it from being just kind of captured by particular interests, even though uh, state officials are ultimately trying to solve problems that are thrown up by the capitalist system. Does that answer your question at all? Thanks, Steve. <laughs> okay, who's next? Anyone else? So while you're thinking, I'll throw out another question. I'm, I'm curious about the uh, kind of the, the way this uh, project uh, unfolded. Did did you find uh, did you did you set out to study GE, or did you discover in the course of your, your research that GE was kind of the paradigmatic uh, corporation uh, at the nexus of all of these uh, uh, things? That, that's a good question, Fred. Yeah, I mean, actually, I, I started off looking at GE before I knew any of this about about uh, its its centrality politically to the integ- to the integral state. Um, I, I it, actually I kind of started off researching it because it seemed relatively banal. I mean, it's obviously cr- crucial for the military industrial complex, but it's not exactly Lockheed Martin, uh, nor is it Monsanto. So it seemed to me like a case that could be looked at in order to understand, you know, the non sensationalist. Uh, element of, of corporate capitalism and corporate power, you know, without, without honing in on the kind of big sensationalist Lockheed Martin makes bombs, you know, Monsanto, you know, destroys agricultural systems and, and so on, you know, a, a more humdrum kind of routine, um, non-sexy kind of uh, approach to the study of corporate capitalism in the U.S. And what I found as I was going through was just kind of surprising to me. Um, you know, I, I kind of did, I genuinely did approach the project with a relatively open mind in terms of what I would find and what kind of a, a project it would be. And, you know, I was astonished, you know, just to find the kinds of relationships that I was finding and the role of GE in, in organizing capital. And also just the extent to which the case of GE served as a, a perfect kind of illustration of the problems with the, the, the arguments around financialization. You know, which which were very much uh, prevalent throughout the time I was working on the project. You know, Greta Krippner uh, and that kind of thing, but also from Marxists. You know, uh, uh, are claiming that you know finance has hollowed out industry, investments been diverted away from industry toward finance. Um, you know, and so it, it really did serve as a great case for engaging all this range of debates that I was kind of interested in, which was just by chance, honestly. But of course, no matter what, it would have been. Would have told us something because you can't look at a major powerful capitalist corporation and, and learn nothing about the way capitalism works but it really did end up being kind of the ideal case uh jake kenza you're next um thank you steve for the presentation i, I enjoyed it um this might be a big question but um um you, were, you talked about how you have a like different phases in the history of the corporation, its relationship to the state. Where do you think it's going now that people say that, I don't want to speak too soon, but neoliberalism might be on the way out. Do you see any um, qualitative changes in that relationship between the state and the corporation that we might see in the future? And yeah. That's, that's the book I'm working on now. So you'll have to uh, you'll have to come back to the session with MEP when when that book is is the subject of discussion. Um, no, I'm kidding. Uh, I am working on that book now, but I can I can give you an answer uh, briefly, which is that yes, I, from my pers- it depends on how you define these things, right? Like if you define neoliberalism as you know the state you know disciplining the working class and enforcing market policies and so on, then obviously we still have neoliberalism because the balance of class forces hasn't shifted and the forms of state discipline are, are all still very much there. Globalization is still, I don't, I don't think we realistically have seen much deglobalization despite some claims that are floating around on the left. Um, so all those basic parameters, what we think of as neoliberalism are still there. But one important thing that's different is uh, the form of corporate governance that has taken shape since the 2008 crisis. And it's continuing now to become entrenched, although may be facing a 
some complications with the shifting central bank policy around uh, interest rates. But basically, you know, neoliberalism, one of the crucial factors of, uh, you know, kind of aspects of it in terms of corporate governance is basically the power of shareholders to discipline the firm. So neoliberal capitalism has oftentimes been referred to as shareholder capitalism, where, you know, coalitions of investors uh, have been able to wield significant disciplinary power over industrial managers uh, in, a, in a relatively decentralized and kind of um, broad sense, rel relatively loose and broad and decentralized sense. That's where you get the turn to kind of uh, shareholder value, where the main purpose of a corporation is supposedly to enrich shareholders by paying dividends and increasing asset valuations. I argue that the neoliberal shareholder capitalism model is now giving way to a different form of corporate governance, um, which I, at, along with my co-writer, Scott Aquano, have called a new finance capital. And the difference is that whereas neoliberal shareholder capitalism is relatively broad, a decentralized form of financial power, and it's characterized by a kind of competitive market for corporate control, like equity markets, the new finance capital is dominated by a small number, basically three, of giant asset management companies uh, who have uh, a, a level of concentration and centralization of capital unprecedented in the whole history of capitalism. They are, you know, historically, it's been the case that either you can be a large shareholder in a particular firm or a relatively small shareholder in a lot of firms. There's a trade-off between diversification and the size of your ownership stakes. With the asset management companies, for the first time, that's been changed. That's been reversed for the first time since the 19th century, early 20th century, with like J.P. Morgan and the literal, you know, people Hilford was talking about in finance capital. These firms are the largest shareholders in basically every single major U.S. company, public, publicly traded U.S. company. This is a, a form of organization that is without precedent, and it's meant that you have the replacement of relatively, or compared to now, relatively liquid markets for corporate control, competitive markets for corporate control, being replaced by relatively illiquid, consolidated blocks of ownership power that extend into every part, every single individual firm uh, across the entire American economy. So what that means is, is many-sided and a complex problem. But it emerged through the quantitative easing programs enacted continuously since 2008, which served to facilitate the inflation of asset prices and turn the primary function of the financial system from banking to asset management. The question, of course, now being whether with interest rates increasing, at least the Federal Reserve is going to attempt to increase interest rates, this uh, structure faces any issues, whether it can continue to exist in the new kind of context that's going to be emerging in the next period well, with fears about inflation growing. Um, and there's a lot of other questions that come with that too. But to, to answer your question, if you look at neoliberalism as a system of corporate governance, or you want to define neoliberalism by the forms of corporate governance that existed at the time, you know, from 1980 you know, to 2008, uh, you would have to say that neoliberalism is being replaced by something different. Uh, and there's been important policy shifts as well in the Federal Reserve that reflect an extension of, their, of new policy tools as well that reflect uh, a, a different kind of policy regime that's struggling to emerge, even though one hasn't been able to be fully consolidated yet beyond just kind of austerity and anti-inflation, kind of strict anti-inflation targeting. Uh, if anyone else would like to speak or ask a question. Uh, Looks like Tanner's hand is up. Yes, I'm just uh, pausing oh, okay. Tanner until if anyone who hasn't spoken yet would like to join us. I see. Go ahead, Tanner. Uh, thanks again. This is just a more general question, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts um, in response to it. But uh, are there examples when the state cannot unify fractions of capital into a unified class, but instead finds itself, you know, even among different state apparatuses or agencies and state technocrats and personnel and even different parties di dividing, you know, due to really, really big disagreements about, say, the future of American national security or even empire and disagreements about the future of capitalism itself? Like, are we... Is, is that typical historically? Is it something that's happened more or less or more so these days? Um, 
I'm, I'm thinking even in terms of just energy, right? And the future of energy, um, you know, between like fossil capital and green, clean, renewable, and so on, um, as, as sort of a site of, of antagonism, perhaps within state apparatuses or parties, but maybe I'm, I'm missing that. So just thinking about counterexamples, when the state fails to unify uh, different fractions into a, into a unified capitalist class, and, and sort of how do we explain those failures at the same time? If the state has this kind of history of, of unifying so effectively, uh, how do we explain the counterexamples when it doesn't? It's a really good and, and tough question, Tanner. Um, but there, there, every case that I just explained involved a long process of wrangling and the outcome of the process was a compromise that re it reflected the the overall impetus of the state as the primary motive force in making policy but ultimately that had to be legitimate by gaining a a a, a significant coalition of support among the major capitalist firms in the absence of that, no policy could possibly succeed. Um, but there, there are, you know, there are critical examples, and and I think that the 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 breaks put on free trade uh, during the 1960s does reflect that the state didn't think it was state officials didn't think it was realistic to even try another round of free trade, given how pissed off major corporations were with the outcome of the Kennedy round. Also, smaller capitalists were getting just crushed at that time as they continued to throughout the 70s, um, although they were able to convince them that they would win something from it um, uh, by, by the way the trade had been restructured. And, um, you know, there was, there was um, the, the, another great example would be the 1970s crisis, where uh, the ability for the state to win capital over to the policy that ended up being enacted through the Volcker shock that is to say, causing a, re a recession in order to um, increase unemployment and disciplined labor uh, almost didn't happen. It, 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 neither the state nor business wanted a recession to occur. Uh, finance was, was on a different side from what I can tell on that particular question in terms of its, its position within the administration that it was expressing to the state. But large manufacturing companies didn't really want a recession. They hoped they could avoid it by continuing with wage and price controls, although the more hysterical uh, among them thought they could uh, just immediately repeal wage and price controls as they were demanding from outside the state. But the people like the Business Roundtable thought they could kind of hold on through wage and price controls, which would hold things together enough until growth could resume and the post-war boom would kind of get restarted. Um, Ultimately, it was, it was the abject failure of that and the political crisis that started to, to emerge around protectionism as the crisis dragged on that really convinced them uh, that they had no choice but to, but to uh, do uh, something like the Volcker shock. Um, a, a policy, if the failure of, a state, of the state to organize a, a ruling class coalition would result in the non-articulation uh, of that policy. Um, that's my theoretical position. And, and so the state, as its very function, articulates the power of the capitalist class. So that's what it does by definition. The question then becomes how it does it. Any state that fails to be able to articulate the, the power of capital would be in a massive political crisis, a, an existential, potentially, political crisis that would actually create a revolutionary situation in which you would have a very severe split within the ruling class potentially and a very severe crisis of the state. Um, you know, not that that would necessarily lead to a revolutionary situation, but it could potentially result in that. Um, that would be a, an extreme form of breakdown. But there have been, like I mentioned, there have been like, crises in the state capital relationship short of that. So that I mentioned earlier the Business Advisory Council uh, which was formed by Franklin Roosevelt in the, in the Commerce Department in order to establish a capitalist consensus around the New Deal. Well, in the 1960s, the largest antitrust uh, uh, offensive in the history of the American state was launched against General Electric, which involved top executives going to prison called the Great Electrical Conspiracy. Basically, they were shown to have been fixing prices 
for Tennessee Valley Authority contracts, along with their competitors, Westinghouse and some smaller independent producers. And they threw top executives in prison. But GE did not fire Ralph Cordner, who was the CEO at the time. And the business, the business Advisory Council, which was still inside the Commerce Department at this time, did not remove him from his position at the head of the Business Advisory Council. So the Commerce Secretary, Luther Hodges, who was a smaller, who was a kind of petty bourgeois uh, capitalist from the South, who kind of had a resentment toward big corporations as it was, took it upon himself to, for the very first time, try to fire the head of the Business Advisory Council. That is to say, to fire Ralph Cordner in order to punish them for the great electrical conspiracy. The result of this was a political crisis in which the Business Advisory Council split from the state. It, it, it announced it was withdrawing from the Commerce Department, would no longer be part of, of the Commerce Department, and would set up its own independent offices and its own independent existence outside of the state. And that it became known instead as the Business Council. This queued off, which included the, the uh, trade crisis, the free trade kind of tensions that I was just mentioning. But this set off a crisis in the state capital relationship, which preceded the economic crisis at the end of the post-war boom, which began to emerge at like 1968. That's when the kind of 1970s crisis got way. This crisis, this political crisis, preceded the economic crisis and was not repaired until the formation of the Business Roundtable in 1971. Indeed, part of the motivation for forming the Business Roundtable, as was acknowledged both by government officials and by corporate executives who were on the Business Roundtable, was to repair the rift that had developed over the Kennedy years and after Johnson between the state and capital and to renew the state's capacity to legitimate its ability to make policy at a, at, a, at a larger level, rather than just this kind of, not just incremental policy, but like something big, like discarding Bretton Woods and moving on with the new global trade regime, to renew the collaboration between the state and capital uh, and, and to establish a new cooperative relationship. Now, it's important not to overstate this because even though the Business Council split from the Commerce Department, in many respects, it remained very close with the state. Its, 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 its internal activities were often uh, uh, open to state officials. And, it, and interestingly, as soon as it split from commerce, one of the first things that it did was pick up the phone, the head of the business council at that time, and call the treasury secretary and say, we want to make a, a closer relationship with the treasury department. Because of course, the treasury department at that time was becoming much more significant in policymaking. And this was an opportunity for the business council to kind of get a, a, a better in with, with what it saw as a, as a more important state agency. So there was a serious crisis of, of the state capital relationship, which was not just about the economic crisis. It would be very easy to reduce this and just say, oh, well, you know, there was tensions because of the 1970s economic crisis. The, the, the crisis in the state capital relationship preceded that. And had it gone further, you know, it's, it's theoretically possible you could imagine the crisis getting worse. I think this, you know, there were similar dynamics possibly at play during moments of the Trump administration um, that where business actually, you know, overall, I don't think was able to um, establish a coherence outside of the state that, that, could, that could challenge the incoherence of Trump in a, in a coordinated way. But there were, there were moments where business acted with surprising coherence and determination uh, and unity of purpose. Uh, by historical standards in standing up to some to things that it thought were unacceptable that Trump was trying to trying to do, including Charlottesville, after which they all pulled out of Trump's uh, advisory councils that he had created uh, around trying to form, form, formulate a new kind of trade uh, global trade policy, um, as well as, the, you know, in the lead up to the to the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the final days of the Trump administration when he was trying to steal the election. Uh, the the unilateral, I mean, sorry, unanimous denouncing of Trump and demanding that he step down from the presidency by every major business association, including the Business Roundtable, but also the National Association of Manufacturers, which is the key base of support for uh, Republican Party politics in the American and, and, and among among business in the American political system. 
So, I mean, those kinds of crises didn't reach a situation where there was like some kind of existential crisis of the state or severe kind of like, you know, paralysis. But, you know, it's theoretically possible that they could. Um, Michael Dolly, you're back with us. Go ahead. Followed by Greg. Did Jay, is Jake on stack or did he just ask a question? I'm sorry. Uh, I think we took care of Jake. Uh, okay. Although if you'd like to defer to Greg, who hasn't spoken yet, uh, then we can take Yeah, yeah. Up. That sounds good. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Right, let Michael Greg, go ahead first. Okay. Let, let Michael go ahead first. He's been in the queue. Okay. Well, one of you go. Just a, a, probably a quick question. I mean, a lot of the sort of maybe social democratic critique uh, that I kind of had in floating around in my head was about um, all of these um, think tanks, you know, AI, Heritage, Cato, what role do they play in your analysis? And also, if you wanted to fold into that, this, you know, the, the ever present, like revolving door um, between business and the state um, in terms of personnel, just to really, you know, basic questions. Thanks again. Michael, those are, that's a really good question. Uh, the think tank uh, infrastructure, it does not, I did not analyze that in, in the book, but I am really interested in looking more into the role that's played by think tanks in formulating policy positions and especially in linking uh, sectors of capital uh, to particular parties and, and party agendas um, and the extent to which that's actually meaningful and effective and autonomous from business. I, that that's, seems to me to be a really important transmission belt, one way or the other, or both ways between between state officials and, and, and capital. And certainly, you know, those those um, think tanks are closely, you know, oftentimes related to the uh, business lobbies that I was just mentioning. You know, they go to the same events, conferences, uh, they speak at each other's uh, events, and they, they play a large role in, um, you know, how each other sees the world. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't look at that explicitly, but it is a really interesting question. Right. Yeah, um, so I've had many discussions with Steve on this already and uh, over the years, and uh, maybe I'll come back to a couple of things I'm still puzzled about. Uh, but I wanted to, just want to say that uh, congratulations on the, on the book coming out. And if I might, I would, I just should, should offer for other people's ears as well. I'm sure uh, Leo would be just beaming at it coming out as well if he could kind of see it in hard copy. <laughs> we'll have to stop by and visit him and kind of maybe leave a copy or <laughs> with him. Uh, Thanks, Greg. I'm sure he would be really pleased with uh, with uh, with uh, the book coming out, Steve. So congratulations Thanks, all around on that. Thank you. Um, I guess I still have a have a have a, a couple of questions that go in different different ways, and uh, um, partly for kind of just others. And, and uh, convince me a bit more, once again, about the difference of of, of the thesis that you're putting forward by, from the corporate liberalism kind of uh, uh, business history that has kind of so much dominated uh, U.S. studies since the since the late 19th century and some of the one of the points about that that stuff, you know, uh, 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 particularly in the political scientists I've, I've studied it, is is actually a key thesis that's been forgotten about of, of how much the American state built itself up in the post uh, uh, Civil War period as as part of kind of the of the full transition to capitalism and building up capacities that were, you know, that were somewhat unique compared to other other states in that process and that. You know, we're part of building American hegemony uh, inside this uh, a capitalist hegemony inside the state and across the state. And one of the things I think still kind of stumble over on this uh, and the integral state is how much uh, 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 the American case and what you're conveying is so specific compared to other cases. You know, where the class struggle can, uh, is taken taken the route through mass parties in a way where these kinds of, uh, of associational interests have to kind of take their route through the parties in a way that they don't quite in this state, both on the, on, uh, both in terms of, of disorganizing workers uh, 
uh, in a way that you know you you know what the state does is also disorganizing those political parties uh, by which workers' interests are expressed, uh, and uh, you know it's just a different conduit. And whether the you would kind of still argue how much you would have to depart from some of your pieces to accommodate, you know, the case of the German state or you know the post-war Italian state, or obviously the other case that we often throw up to study these kinds of things of the Japanese case. Um, that's one. The other, the other is I, I, I wonder when you've been saying this, expressing it so strongly about uh, about not just uh, uh, interbureaucratic politics inside the state, but expressing it uh, in the sense of of, an, of a bureaucratic interest in the strong sense, as if those interests could be paralleled to the types of interests that form amongst the capitalist class and the types of rewards, rewards competitive pressures, etc. Even when we express class interest, you know, the, one of the things we immediately know that the, the interests of the capitalist class are expressed in particular ways that organize them as a class in a particular way, which is very different from the interests which workers are, are attempting to express and have to express in the kind of pre the, 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 the way that interests and or, uh, um, interests uh, intersect with organization. It seems to me it's so different inside the state uh, that I you know, when you're saying it, sometimes I have, I could kind of read the neoliberal theory of the state and bureaucratic interests. And when you express it so strongly, and I tend to, I've always tended to avoid using uh, bureaucratic interest as a whole, as opposed to actually trying to uh, argue something that comes from the way that you use the integral state. That is, you know, the, the articulation of, of, of the state and corporate interests in a way that kind of uh, is attempting to consistently find a way of organizing the capitalist class and extending their interests. And that is what is forming inter-bureaucratic competition. Uh, and that what you still need is at, a, at some level of the state, either through the political parties or the most senior levels of the executive, you have to be able to forge at any given moment the, you know, some, some, uh, some uh, uh, assessment of the, of the general capitalist interest. You know, which is, you know, and particularly, and what's interesting is the complexity of trying to form that in the American state, as opposed to, you know, in many other states, is the particular apparatus or the or the mass party of the business classes is is forming that interest. And so I just, you know, at that level, I I think on the one, you know, we're just, you know, just trying to figure out how to kind of uh, uh, the the extent of your the, of how you're using the integral the integral state, how would it modify specific hypotheses or arguments about different states, but I, I am hesitant still to, to identify any interest in a parallel way to what's formed amongst the capitalist classes with a bureaucratic interest as opposed to the way that bureaucracies are major points of condensation and our, our argument and, and organizing of capitalist interests or disorganizing uh, working class interests, as you, as you put it. OK, uh, so we're all done now. We get to go home. Or, uh, <laughs> um, those are those are you as know, you know, Leo would be upset if I didn't ask you one really hard question. <laughs> no, no, that it got back to what we were debating for many years. So yeah, I had I don't to know. do it. I had to do it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I appreciate it. Actually, it's a very it's very thoughtfully put and very well put. Um, so in terms of, I, I didn't quite get what you were referring to with corporate liberalism, but um, to diff the way I differentiate myself, just to take the easiest one first, the way I differentiate myself with corporate liberalism is that it's basically a myth because the corporate liberalism theory thesis is that there is a kind of like group of major corporations that were kind of nice guys and, you know, they were committed to a liberal uh, framework of world order and domestic politics, you know, peripheral to the new deal if not fully embracing it um, because they were more interested in labor peace than labor costs and so that kind of fostered a liberal um, grouping among among the corporate elite at a particular time which then fell apart later in fact my book is a direct challenge to that thesis because it not only shows that that the managerial vanguard as i refer to them that emerged around the 1930s um, was was by no means committed to liberalism but that it also was formed through the process of the integral state organizing that I'm describing. So it was, it was a function of state power 
more than anything that led to the formation of this well and and economic structures of of corporate control which led to the 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 managerial vanguard playing the kind of role it did in building support for the new deal um and and afterwards and and the, the reason why my book the other reason why the book is a is a challenge to that corporate liberalism thesis is that the very same individuals who were supposedly corporate liberals would later go on to be the champions of undoing the New Deal, um, and you know, including GE's executives. Those guys became pivotal for the project of rebuilding the Republican Party all throughout the South, um, which I recount in one of the chapters in the book. Coming, uh, you know, af after the 1950s, 1960s, they they are basically doing na national scale, uh, integral state organizing at the state level. To rebuild state Republican parties and challenge the solid uh, with the breakup of the solid South after the civil rights movement and allow this, the Republican Party to kind of become resurgent through the whole process of boosterism and the integration of the South after the breakup of the solid South. Um, so they were they were more if you're going to identify them as a party, it would be easier to do it as as Republican activists than liberal ones. Um, but in terms of differences with other capitalist states with. Uh, oh, you, yeah. So then you asked about the distinctiveness of the American state and how it was built up from the post-Civil War and the forms of capitalist hegemony inside the state. Yes, that that was a critical process. And Skoranek's book, you know, The New American State, was was a very big influence on those chapters in this book. Um, and the centralization of state administration, uh, you know, uh, and its and its separation relatively from from congressional policymaking um, processes and its increasing autonomy from those processes. Uh, but what I add is that is that I think my critique of Skoranek, which I have in the book, is that, you know, he, he doesn't look at what makes this a capitalist state. So like the the processes of bureaucratic centralization he's looking at in the state uh, are parallel to driven by and reflective of the centralization of economic power in the hands of the corporations, which are reinforcing each other. So the, the bureaucratic centralization reinforces and is reinforced by the concentration and centralization of capital in large national scale and then international corporations. So those processes whereby corporate power was integrated into this bureaucracy from the word go are kind of absent from a lot of those accounts. Um, and so the capitalist hegemony that's emerging inside the state in those periods, which I try to show, is kind of left implicit in like Skoranek's account and a lot of uh, the other associated scholarship that's been done by people like Gary Gersel. Um, and so then you asked about the, the differences with, with other capitalist states and strong parties. So I'm, one of the things I'm really interested in doing actually going forward is a comparative analysis of the business roundtable in the US with the, with the uh, Canadian Business Council in Canada, the Business Council in Canada, and how uh, this, these processes of integral state organizing or building capitalist class power through, through the agency of the state differs. Um, one way that obviously, of course, you know, the Canadian state has a strong party system like Greg was just referring to, whereby, you know, um, a party is what's elected rather than an individual politician to a particular office, unlike the American system. One of the one of the uh, differences from just the preliminary, you know, things that I've thought through without having done the research yet is that um, in, in states with a strong party system, interest groups become somewhat less significant. And the forms of coordination between business and the state take a different form as a result. So for example, in the case of the American state, you have to organize these individual politicians who are not part of an internally coherent disciplined party apparatus as individuals, which means that business and the state liaison has to take the form of uh, a multifaceted uh, uh, interaction between a num numerous different uh, officials and agencies. Whereas in, in strong party systems, it can be more centralized, that relationship. And that seems to have been the case from the little that I know uh, relatively uh, with the Canadian state and the Liberal Party, based on Reg Whitaker's books, for example. Um, it seems like, like uh, you can have a much more centralized and party-centric form of, of this kind of coordination. Uh, whereas in the US case with the weak party system, it's much more decentralized and disaggregated, and therefore you need stronger interest groups to pull all these different forces together and centralize them and build consensus around particular agendas. Um, that's just a very preliminary hypothesis. 
but I'd be extremely interested in exploring those differences between. One of the things I think that comes across well in the in the in, 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 the, in the book and the argument is is and it's a paradox for most people is 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 the case that you in the in the U.S. both has a very strong administrative state and people often don't realize it that starts in the 19th century that built up quite you know maybe some of the most powerful state capacities anywhere in the world <laughs> and not just in the where we know in the military uh but in other areas and that's the paradox and what you do is add to what's chronic leaves out okay what interests are being served by that powerful administrative state and you know around the world uh, uh including in the u.s people think of the u.s as being a relatively often weak state associating it with kind of a uh, you know, not recognizing its power as a capitalist state. Uh, 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 and I think that's a very powerful thesis you have. And that's what I think becomes so interesting as you're just uh, starting to think through the comparison with other places with the different party systems and how these things uh, affect that. But it's that paradox that becomes quite so interesting in, yeah. in, the, in the presentation. Thanks, Greg. Um, yeah, so I just want to answer your last question, though, which is the hardest one. <laughs> Which is, which is about the interest within state agencies. And from what I'm, what I'm, the question I'm hearing you ask is how it's different from the, indiv the interests of particular like firms. Is that what you're trying to get at? Just that sometimes when I, when you're presenting it tonight, tonight, I kept on hearing, I could have seen, uh, you know, I could have heard, uh, uh, James Buchanan. Uh, not, not, to, not to blasphemize uh, you that way, but, you know, you know, the interests of kind of the state, you know, and the way bureaucratic interests and self-serving and the rest of it, the, you know, the, the, the Hayekian form of the state that he develops to kind of, uh, you know, to, to develop his, his uh, new public management theorization of how you break up the bureaucracy, you know, and, and what, you, what you're arguing is not that kind of interest being formed, but uh, you know, just uh, the, the the terminology sometimes falls into that notion, whereas you're really trying to emphasize not so much the bureaucratic interest in itself, but in its con, but it, but but the whole notion of the integral state takes you to think of that interest in relationship to the capitalist class interest that it's organizing. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The the question basically comes down to the question of the unity of the state, and and how the unity of the state is established. And it is established and it's established based on, you know, um, a coherence that's imposed through the executive office of the president, primarily in the office of management and budget. And, you know, the those central kind of centrifugal forces pulling these different agencies together has at different times sought explicitly to encourage competition between uh, agencies in order to secure budget cuts and, and kind of download uh responsibility for administration while, uh, you know, allowing them autonomously, which basically amounts to autonomously allowing them to, to find their own cuts while preserving their most favored programs. Um, you know, the state, though, ultimately does establish a unity and the competition or, co or bureaucratic contestation that happens between agencies um, is not the same as the market competition between firms to maximize profits. It's 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 a competition or a contestation or a conflict over relative prominence within the within the the, the policy making apparatus of the state, and in expressing particular uh, agency views and um, agency tools to the executive office of the president, and, and as hopefully being the chosen one to receive specific responsibility for implementing and making policy. Um, there's something to on this point. There's something to what the you know mainstream public administration uh, people point out, right? The the, the, the administrative state in, in the U.S. is so politically commanded, that the way that, that it, it forms in the presidential office and the range of, of, of appointment structures that occurs, whereas in the in in in, uh, in the parliamentary systems along the British along the British model are all kind of uh, commanded, especially by the bureaucracy. Uh, and and have relatively weak political control, and the American case has a, has a different formation. So that, you know that articulation of the int of, of that forming that kind of general capitalist interest has different conduits to it. But it also I think it, it, it you know speak it also does speak to the 
you know, that what, another reason why the, the American administrative state, state is actually stronger than most people think it is. Mm -hmm. Yes, and, and the most interesting case in, in exploring this is the Commerce Department. You know, from having yeah. been from having been formed in 1903 with to, to basically manage and liaise with corporations rivaling its rivalry with the State Department, which was very explicit. It was very, you know, in terms of its internal self understanding of these relationships, it was very deliberately conscious of this rivalry. It needed to it needed to gain turf from the State Department if it was going to be viable over the long term all the way, you know, through the, the New Deal period when it was, you know, one of the most important venues for working with business around the New Deal programs, if not the most. And then in the 1970s, the, when, when the Commerce Department kind of fell into crisis and, and literally you have people panicking that, again, you, know, you don't have a, 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 a grounds for a quote unquote viable and continuing Department of Commerce and therefore seeking to take on these new trade functions in order to just make sure that the Commerce Department has a place in the state complex. Mm -hmm. And it does indeed over the 70s get totally restructured, basically from the ground up around, um, re around enforcing and implementing the, the free trade agreement that came out of Tokyo. Yeah. Um, and then of course the advisory system I mentioned in the 70s as well. So it, it, it's the most interesting case for that reason. And it comes out yeah. completely different from the 70s than it went in. Yeah, um, it's, it's an interesting comparison because if you, if you look at, uh, you know, the Anglo countries, Canada, Australia, and the UK, the departments of industry are relatively weak <laughs> that are the parallel to the Department of Commerce. Uh, you know, and, and the, 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 the elite capitalists are always in control of, 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 the, of the Ministry of Finance or, or the, the Ministry controlling the overall state expenditure budget and less on the ministries. Then in the case, in other cases where you've had much more mass parties and contestation over over control of industry, say in Italy, like Italy, France, and even to some extent Germany, then the ministries of industry in those cases have greater parallels to the Commerce Department. Yes, and and but there's also there's also another dimension of this in the case of the Commerce Department, which gets back to Tanner's question, which is that in the 1970s, as it was devising all this trade advisory architecture, and then at the end of the 70s, when the Department of Commerce was the leading force in organizing the President's Export Council, which was supposedly going to be the top premier advisory body for the president. It was hoping, top officials in the Commerce Department were hoping that it would become the, the location within the state of a robust new industrial policy that would basically be a kind of new German style export or Japanese style export led growth model, that it would be the, the vehicle for organizing this. And that didn't happen. Um, instead, what happened is they, they it was the, whether this was intended all along or not, it's hard to know. Commerce certainly wasn't in on it. Um, at least from the memos that I reviewed. But uh, what ended up happening was, you know, this export-led growth strategy that commerce was supposedly going to coordinate through a massive expansion of the Export-Import Bank, the exact opposite happened. And it, 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 in, in effect, it, it was held out as a way of bringing small and medium-sized businesses into the free trade coalition at the end of the 1970s under the hegemony of the big multinationals. And then after the agreement was passed, and uh, 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 capitalist compliance was secured, the rug yanked under, uh, from under their feet as those very agreements that were being negotiated while this was being done were, 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 were tethering and, and limiting the ability for, the, for things like the Export-Import Bank to offer subsidies uh, and export credits. So the end result was that far from commerce ending, ending up or being the central organizational node within the state for this new kind of MIDI style, you know, Japanese style, export led growth strategy, it ended up basically serving as an advisory mechanism for the U.S. trade representative and then an enforcement apparatus to imp implement the policies that were the trade US, U.S. trade representative was devising. Uh, that served in the meantime to bring small and medium sized businesses who were getting screwed over by liberalization and would get even more screwed over by the next round of liberalization into the consensus. Uh, by promising them that they were going to be given this export support, which was then foreclosed by those very agreements. The agreements themselves negotiated away the space to, to do the kinds of export support. They were called non-tariff barriers now, and the, and the, the Export-Import Bank was uh, uh, you know, significantly limited in its activities, and it would only become more so over time. Um, so that would, you know, the, the Commerce Department it's significant, 
it's it's a it's a uh, it's a place where you know one of the primary uh, points of contact between the global trade regime, post Brentwood's trade regime, and the American capitalist class. It serves therefore as a kind of really important illustration of what Robert Cox and Leo Panitch and Sam Gindin have called the internationalization of the state, whereby the internal organization of the state uh, is restructured in order to implement an international agreement. Um, but also it's, it's hardly what it aspired to be uh, at the beginning of the 1970s, uh, which was basically MIDI. Okay, we have a few more minutes left if anyone else would like to join the conversation. Uh, it's been really uh, exciting uh, watching the, uh, the Greg Alba, Steve Mayer dialogue here. I'm sure complicating uh, many uh, such uh, dialogues in seminar rooms in Toronto. We, we didn't swear at each other for a change, though. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if we're uh, kind of out of... Uh, Lillian, Lillian, Lillian. 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 Hi, this has um, been really, really interesting. I actually live in a town where GE uh, polluted the river back in the 60s, and we're still fighting it. Um, so really curious to read this book and wondering if it's coming out in paperback. <laughs> <laughs> you and me both. Uh, you know, I, I, I have been haranguing the publisher. Um, and apparently that's the only way that you can relate to them um, to, uh, you know, issue a, to publish a lower cost paperback version. They have committed to a paperback, but as of now, according to their, you know, market analysis, they don't actually make more money if the paperback is a lower price. Uh, so I have to put in a special, they have to put in a special request for a cheaper paperback, which all depends on sales of this uh, edition. Um, we'll see, uh, you know, I'm not optimistic that it will be that much cheaper, but um, I certainly hope so. And if it gets, if the book gets any kind of recognition or, you know, if it, if it ends up being talked about significantly, that will improve its chances of getting a, a paperback version. But, you know, um, there, there is a, there is a, a, a flyer that I gave to Michael that offers 20% off um, of the book from its current price, which is obviously really high. And I'm embarrassed to even ask people to pay that for it. So don't feel the need to. <laughs> um, but you know, there's also e-copies available and, and that kind of thing. Um, hopefully, libraries will pick it up. Um, I was really disappointed by the price tag, so it's not my decision. Michael, did you want to say any something? Uh, a minute ago, you were. No, I just wanted to uh, pop in so I was visible and and vocal to. Appreciate Steve's coming today, and it was great to see you, Greg and Tanner. I forgot that you and Steve were friends from your uh, first visit for last year's Socialist Register. It's great to see you show up. Thank you. Thanks, thanks, Michael. It's nice to see you too. So, um, again, thank you, Fred, for. Uh, coordinating this and Steve really good to see you come back east though those pictures from the Canadian Rockies were fantastic <laughs> see those again yeah me too <laughs> thanks Michael I'll, I'm sure we'll get together in New York soon in person I hope uh, when things allow for that to happen Okay, I'm just putting a reminder in the chat of the MEP's uh, next event, which is uh, on uh, Saturday uh, on uh, China. June 4th, not this Saturday. This Saturday, uh, Saturday June 4th, uh, in two weeks, almost. Uh, and I guess that's it for the evening. Thanks again, Steve, very much. Uh, Thanks, guys. We'll uh, see you again soon, everyone. I hope so. Thanks so much, go, everyone. Go, go, have a big, go, go have a big scotch, Steve. <laughs> Will do, Greg. I was going to do it anyway, but now that you're I'm, I'm doing it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Talk to you guys Bye. later. Bye-bye.